folks. Welcome back to another episode of the Pick Up and Play podcast. My name is DJ Switch, and today is a very special episode. It's a conversation that I didn't think I was going to be able to have, and yet here it is. My guest today is the Unipiper, the one and only Portland based Unipiper is on the show today. His real name is Brian, and we have a whole conversation about his relationship with the Portland Retro Gaming Expo. We have a whole conversation about his podcast that he does once a month. Uh, we have a conversation about the organization that he works with that is striving to keep Portland weird while also raising funds for other entertainers and uh, folks who are trying to bring more art, more culture, more entertainment to the Portland scene. And uh, the way that he's going about that and and the things that he and the people that he is working with uh, to do that, it's, it's a fascinating conversation. And it's got me genuinely very excited about what a post-pandemic Portland looks like with the Unipiper still doing what he does. Uh, and so I am very excited to have on the podcast today, the one and only Unipiper. Of course, I have to give a huge thank you to the folks that are supporting me on Patreon. A massive thank you to the Portland Retro Gaming Expo. Uh, and a particular shout out to Rick from the Portland Retro Gaming Expo, who sent me a list of vendors and people associated with the expo that he'd like to see on the show. And the Unipiper was toward the top of that list. So, um, you know, big shout out to Rick from the Portland Retro Gaming Expo for su the suggestion of having the Unipiper on. Um, and, uh, of course, last but not least, I have to give a big thank you to my sponsor, Vault 31 Bar, who uh, I will be telling you a little bit more about later on in the show. One more quick announcement before we get into the interview. I will be hosting a lo-fi VGM party at Vault 31 Bar later this month, April 20th, 2024. I'll be hosting a lo-fi VGM party and celebrating my 40th birthday party at the same time. So if you want to win some free records from Kiraga Records, if you want to uh, uh, win some other prizes from our other sponsor, Final Form, a local record shop here in the Portland area that specializes in video games and video game music on vinyl, uh, then come through vault 31 bar. There's going to be no cover. If you're in the Portland area, uh, I highly, highly recommend hanging out at vault 31. Anyway, the idea is that it's going to be a bit of a mental spa day for gamers. I want to keep it lo-fi. I want to keep it chill. We're going to do led candles, uh, for lighting. And, uh, it's going to be a nice, calm, relaxing time. I'm not going to be performing. I'll just be playing some records, some lo-fi records, and, uh, and I'll just be sort of like curating a, a playlist via vinyl all night long. And, uh, and so I'm very excited about this event and I hope that you will consider joining. Uh, I'll have a link to the Facebook event in the description on the YouTube, uh, upload for this show. So hopefully, uh, you can get more information there and hopefully I'll be able to see you there. Okay. With that said, please enjoy my interview with the Unipiper. Brian, thanks so much for hanging out with me today. I really appreciate your time. Sure. Excited to be here. <laughs> uh, now, did you get a chance to check out the show before you agreed to do this or were you just down to like <laughs> hang out? <laughs> no, I mean, you know, anything related to the uh, Retro Game Expo, that community, yourself, like it checked all my boxes. Ah, nice, nice, nice. Yeah, we do love to keep Portland weird, right? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so uh, I definitely want to get into, obviously, your identity as the Unipiper and some of the work that you've been doing, uh, let's say let's say post-pandemic, uh, just last couple of years. I'm kind of curious about like what you've been up to. Um, but before we get into all of that, I want to learn a little bit more about Little Unipiper and... What were some of the, maybe the video games that you played as a kid that that made you really connect with video gaming, uh, both maybe as a as a pastime, as an art form, as a community? Uh, tell me a little bit about that. Sure. Um, you know, I, I think anyone of our relative age is probably their life path is defined by what consoles they had growing up, right? Hey, who are you calling old? <laughs> <laughs> um. My earliest gaming memories uh, come from a Commodore 64 uh, that we had in the house. Um, okay. So I think that... we just became best friends. <laughs> but please continue. 
So, that, you know, that's where I cut my chops. And, you know, uh, most of those games uh, didn't even work anyway. So it was lots of uh, trial and error and jiggling the handle on the drive reader. Um, but uh, from there, uh, you know, I went into uh, I had a, um, I never had an NES. So I like missed out on on that nostalgia. Um, but uh, I had uh, a Game Boy um, that I lived on. Um, and then from there, it was, um, I, I guess, post, uh, my path started out uh, down the Sega, not the Nintendo route, because I had a, a Sega Genesis. So I was, I was a Mario kid, before, I mean, a, a Sonic kid before, before I was introduced to Mario. That wouldn't come until the next generation with the uh, N64, which I, I got like on release day. And I still remember opening that on Christmas and Mario 64, you know, blowing my mind. Um, but, but I, I guess the, you know, the one thing that I kind of left out is, um, PC gaming, you know, um, the moved on from the Commodore 64 and, uh, got into a little bit of, uh, PC gaming, but primarily like my jam were all of the classic, uh, LucasArts adventure titles. Um, the secret of monkey Island monkey is Island. Um, yeah. yeah, my favorite <laughs> game of all time right there, the whole series, but particularly the first and second games. Uh, I had the, uh, uh, collector's edition of it was like a there was like a collector's edition of the third monkey island game but it came with a disc that had the first two. Oh yeah yeah i think uh, that was like the monkey madness disc or something something like that yeah but uh what was it th- was it escape from monkey island was the third one the third one was curse curse thank you yeah. um so i i played basically up to that point in the entire series uh in the in the mid 2000s and then of course later we got the episodic Monkey Island stuff that they did on the Wii and 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 uh, released on Steam and mm-hmm. then um, and then I, the only Monkey Island game I haven't played is the most recent one, the one that was kind of looked like Paper Mario sort of. Yeah, yeah. With, um, with um, series creator Ron Gilbert returning, and I thought it was fantastic. I, I've um, heard nothing but good things. I just yeah. haven't had a chance to to do it yet. Um, I, I, um, you know, when it came out, life was just so busy and like, it's kind of insane to think that a game of that magnitude had come out and I hadn't played it, but I, I like waited a whole year. Um, I think that was good because it kind of let the hype and stuff die down. And then I got to enjoy it on my own terms and it just lived up to expectations. It's funny. The, uh, um, the, the limited run release that they did where it was like the, like big box set with all of the games i i own that uh, yeah so uh i missed out on that for the switch um uh, and uh that was the point where i swore to myself i wasn't going to continue to let limited run dictate my happiness <laughs> um and so that's where i started buying games and um i was just talking with somebody recently about how i i have i think four or five like ultimate edition limited run games mm-hmm. um scott pilgrim uh turtle shredders revenge uh both of the um both of the first two no more heroes games um so i've i've they've been getting my money uh and every time i tell myself like okay this is the last time i'm not going to do this again and then a couple months goes by and then sure enough they release something that i can't live without and i'm just the cycle repeats. <laughs> I mean, I don't know about you, but I today buy almost exclusively like physical games. Yes. Um, I, I, you know, if something's come out, you know, first thing I do that I'm interested in is see if it's been gotten a physical release or if one's planned or something like it, it whenever I have to buy a digital game, it just mm, hurts my soul just a little bit. <laughs> I'm the exact same way. Uh, so funny enough, my dad owned a Commodore store uh, as a kid, <laughs> uh, opened a Commodore store in December of 84. And then in wow. the summer of 85, he got uh, a shipment that wasn't supposed to go out with the first 25 Amiga 2000s on the West Coast. Um, they misprinted something on the product compliance code label on the power supplies, and they had to like stop the trucks out of the plant in Texas and reprint all those labels for the Amiga power supplies and the computers and then like repackage everything. Wow. Uh, But not before one truck left for Oregon. And my dad had the (laughs) only 25 Amiga 2000s in the summer of 85 that you could get on the West coast uh, and sold all of them for like a ridiculous amount of money. 
and uh <laughs> and so that was kind of like that was my childhood was the commodore or the amiga we were pretty strict amiga right up until i got my sega genesis so i also skipped the nes um <laughs> my cousin had one one of my best friends had one but mm -hmm. i completely bypassed the 8-bit and went straight to 16 with the genesis um and yeah. then and then the n64 was the next one for me so uh yeah very very weirdly similar stories you and i indeed, i think indeed indeed yeah <laughs> um, you, um so my next weird uh uh gaming progression like uh i did not have a, a ps1 did you no no <laughs> that's the thing i okay so check this out i bought a 360 and then like a week later bought a ps2 like very late in the ps2 life cycle so that was my first playstation was the ps2 technically but it was so late in the life cycle of the ps2 that like you know there were a few really common games i could get my hands on but otherwise there was a lot of stuff that was even out of print by that point mm -hmm. for the ps2 that um was already on the collector market so like I only played a few things for the PS2 and then I had the 360 at the same time. So I was kind of juggling two consoles in college. Um, while at the same time I had my GameCube, which yeah. honestly was yep. my favorite of the three because uh, at that point, Nintendo owned me um, yeah. <laughs> and they still kind of do. Yep. I went from a uh, <laughs> Dreamcast, which I loved yeah. uh, to, to the GameCube. Man, one of my best buddies had a Dreamcast, but like, I, I and honestly, it was so far ahead of its time. And to this it day, I wish Sega so had hung well. around the hardware, the hardware space. But uh, CD burners, man. <laughs> yep, death knell of uh, Sega there. <laughs> um. So okay, so you uh, obviously you were a pretty passionate gamer. You still are a pretty passionate gamer. It seems like. Does any of that gaming experience lend to what you do now as the Unipiper? And are there other spaces in Portland where you find yourself contributing to the sort of greater gaming community? Mm, mm, that's interesting. Um, I, I mean, absolutely. I would say that uh, my gaming background uh, informs what I do as, as the Unipiper. Um, you know, in because uh, obviously playing the bagpipes as the Unipiper, like music is a big part of, of my life. And um, I have to draw inspiration from somewhere. And I, I think video games are a source of inspiration uh, musically uh, for me and, and the pipes um, in a lot of ways. Well, in maybe just one kind of way, but the, the bagpipes, I, I think, lend themselves to game music uh, in a way because they are kind of like a, a raw, primitive sound with a very limited range. Um, it, it, you know, it's kind of like, uh, comparable to eight bit, you know, and 16 bit chip tunes. Yeah. Um, and, uh, even though I've only got nine notes on the bagpipes, um, every time I find another, uh, gaming tune that works on them, uh, yeah, I, I just love figuring out what, what kind of songs I can play. You know, I, I can do some Mario and some, uh, Sonic stuff. Uh, um, the, uh, Metroid, uh, save jingle is really fun to play on the bagpipes. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, so so absolutely yeah i i love uh uh taking video game music and then trying to arrange it for, for bagpipes because i think that's one of those things that maybe a lot of folks don't know about the unipiper because the, the obviously the star wars stuff the darth vader mask went super duper viral back in the day right. um which by the way now that you're here i've got something in common with kimmel um Actually, two things because next week we've got Meryl Streep on. Uh, no, I'm kidding. Uh, that's she's not, she give a shit about this show. Um, uh, but in seriousness, um, you do far more than just Star Wars stuff with the bagpipes and with the unicycle. Like, you, I, I've seen video clips of you doing a lot of really nerdy music, and your tastes are are pretty broad when it comes to sort of the greater nerd sphere: video games, movies, TV. Um, so like is it is it just about being a professional nerd at this point like like mm -hmm. just leaning into the things that you love in your in your free time and trying to sort of like incorporate that into what you do in the act or like how does that how does that crossover happen and and where do you pull that inspiration from i mean that that's kind of a, essentially what it is uh you know is, is you get 
uh, into your 30s and beyond and your uh, time that you have for leisure activities uh, dwindles, you know, you, you've only got a, a limited pool of sources to pull from. And, you know, if you're t- making the effort to still include gaming in there, obviously that's going to spill over in, into the uh, other aspects of your life, um, which is uh, exactly what, what kind of happens uh, here. Um, you know, that right now, uh, it, it seems like gaming for me now comes in fits and spurts. Like, um, I'll, I'll, I'll be really busy for a while with lots of little projects going on and, and then things will kind of, uh, ease up and I'll just like dive headfirst into some gaming for, for a month or so and just, uh, try and get caught up on some stuff that I missed out on, um, you know, a, a whole lot. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, it's, uh, I am a gamer through and through and I, um, you know, over the past decade or so, as as my time for gaming, um, uh, I didn't have as much. So, you know, I, now I am trying to work through this backlog of, of things that um, there's been some so many great games that I, I I think just in general, there's also it seems like way more game choices now than there was, you know, 20, 30 years ago, or at least, you know, the, the, the time commitment that you need to put into a game in order to fully enjoy it. You know, you weren't necessarily playing these uh, uh, 16-bit games 30, 40 hours. Uh, you know, you could in, in, com- quote unquote complete a game, and you know, speedrunners now do it in four minutes. But you know, <laughs> might have been an, an hour or two game. Sure. Um, it's just so hard to stay up on everything. Yeah. Uh Yeah. I. I mean, uh, I like to. I when I was. Twitch streaming a lot. I used to joke with my audience that I was in my very, 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 very late twenties. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, uh, but I, I completely feel that man, as we, as we get older, you know, bills pile up, responsibilities pile up. Uh, you know, some of us have families. Uh, and so that obviously takes away, you know, little, little things sort of chip away at our, at our time for gaming here and there. And so, yep. um, the other thing that I've noticed though, being around the retro gaming scene and, and being around a community of like hardcore collectors, the longer we go, the deeper, the well of games you have to play will get. Yep. Cause the good games are still good in 2024, but there's more good games coming out all the time. Yep. Um, and so when you couple that with the fact that we're, you know, 20 years removed from like the Nintendo Wii, uh, and the Xbox uh, 18 years, but like, you know, might as well call it 20. Right. Um, I mean, people don't realize that, that retro in 2024 doesn't necessarily just mean the Genesis and the super Nintendo. Like it goes way beyond that. And all of those catalogs are just getting deeper and deeper and deeper. I was thinking about that today and thinking back onto like the first retro gaming expo that I went to, it was probably the, I'm guessing it was probably the second or third uh, year of the show when I first discovered it. And like at that time, retro gaming meant a very <laughs> specific thing, a very, and it covered a very kind of specific time frame. Yeah. Um, but just over the years, it's been amazing to see how that definition has expanded to encompass, you know, uh so much broader of the gaming canon and and you know uh, is now appeals to a much wider demographic and uh age range of people who enjoy it yeah i mean the uh the show has certainly been around for a minute um i guess it was uh uh it was a it was a different uh retro gaming event that started in 1998 uh, and then in 2006, they sort of rebranded and turned it into a different thing that is m- more close to what we know now as the Portland Retro Gaming Expo. Mm-hmm. Um, and then in 2011, I think, uh, from what I'm told, is when they like formed a board and sort of incorporated and and became an official like not for profit event. That um, and it was it was around that same time that they started looking into growing into the convention center and. Uh, but 2011 was also the year that I jumped on as the DJ for the arcade and, um, they were at the double tree at the time. Yeah. And I think there was like two years of doing the double tree. And then if I remember right, I think 2013 is when they finally like officially moved to the convention center. Um, and that was a, that was a weird jump because we went from 
like two or three thousand people to ten. Yeah, <laughs> or clo- or close to it. Like those those are soft numbers. Please don't like quote me on that. But um, but yeah, it was it was weird. Just the just moving the event to the convention center how much that sort of opened everything up and how many more people were able to attend without feeling like claustrophobic and stuff. It was crazy. Yeah. And then I'm sure, you know, there's the concern of like whether or not you'd be able to fill up the space and, and have it seem like a successful event with yeah. such a large space. <laughs> yeah. At, at, at first that definitely was, uh, um, that definitely was something that they were concerned about. But then after the first couple of years, they were like, now nah, we got this. And, and it was nice that, um, you know, for as much uh, bureaucratic red tape nonsense that comes with working with the convention center, um, the one big upside is that the space that we take up can scale with the event. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, moving air walls and expanding into, you know, external rooms and, and conference rooms, and they've got the ballroom upstairs that we've held some auction events and stuff. Um, and so, like, as the... Portland Retro Gaming Expo has grown over the years. Uh, thankfully, that space has been able to grow with us. But uh, I'm a little bit curious, though, because as the Unipiper, like, you attend a lot of stuff around Portland. Like, you're constantly, basically, anytime there's, uh, like, more than 30 people gathered, <laughs> there's a non-zero chance that the Unipiper is going to show up. Um, sure. so what uh, what goes into the decisions that you make as far as, like, what, events that you attend what events you support are there any that you're actually involved in it's really um challenging now because um i think people do generally have that thought that uh you know <laughs> if there is like over 30 people like you said there's a non-zero chance the unipiper could be there um <laughs> but you know I, I am only one person um and yeah. you know juggling that and a day job uh and a family uh, and gaming too, um, it, it becomes very hard and I have to be, uh, extremely selective and careful about my time. Um, so I guess one of the fortunate things, you know, because I have a day job and I'm not having to rely on, uh, performing as the Unipiper for, for my living, um, I get to, I have a little bit more flexibility in, in terms of things that I choose to do. So now I primarily, um, just do things that, are of interest to me uh that i want to do keep it interesting um you know keep the passion there um and uh the gaming expo is just one of those things that i think is um i i have very i feel very strongly about um so i always love uh participating in it um you know the uh i'm, I'm very also very big in the uh portland craft beer world Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, I, I, I do a lot of things to support that, um, and, um, you know, moving into sort of other things that I have going on right now. Um, I, I actually am working with, um, a nonprofit that I started, uh, called weird Portland United. Um, and of course they're the Portland's only 501 C3 dedicated to keeping Portland weird. Um, and one of the, uh, things that we have going on to raise funds for the organization is a, a collaboration with gigantic brewing um and we, we do, we're doing a series of beers called um a weird tastic series and uh every uh four months or so we'll release a new beer celebrating some uh unique uh aspect of weird portland or, or celebrating a, a personality that's been influential in in portland's uh uh reputation as this bastion of weird um so uh yeah that that's um uh something that i do because i i get to do it because i want to and it uh raises money for a good cause that's super cool man and i i was uh gonna ask you about weird portland a little bit later on um but uh uh uh, it's good to know that a lot of these projects that that you started years ago are are still around and still kicking and still doing stuff um because i i know that like you know, March, like March of 2020 basically put a screeching halt to my career as a full-time DJ. Right. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and as much as that sounds like a terrible thing, it, it kind of was, but kind of wasn't like, there's definitely been some upsides. You know, I've, I've moved into online content creating, which I think is better for like my overall growth and creativity as a, as a entertainer. 
Um, it also allows me to sort of like step back and focus on like you events that I want to be a part of and not necessarily stuff that I have to be a part of. So, sure. like, you know, being a, being a nerd DJ and playing comic conventions and gaming events and, and the Portland retro gaming expo and stuff like that, like that to me is more true to who I am as a person. And I have so little interest in continuing my career in the terrestrial nightlife scene. Like, <laughs> Like the, I've, I've played m almost every club in Portland. Um, well, at least at one point I had, I mean, there've been several that have popped up in recent years that I may never play. Um, but, uh, uh, but doing the club DJ thing, just, it, it, I was never passionate about that world. It was just where the work was. Yeah. You know, and so after doing that for a long time, I just, you know, I kind of got the sort of like the kick that I needed the last couple of years to be like, no, nah, I'm just going to, I'm just going to focus on nerd stuff. I'll play gaming conventions and, you know, yep. comic parties and, and, and nerd bars. And like, I'm just going to stick to that world. Um, so I, I can totally, totally understand, you know, it <laughs> feels, feels good not having to say yes to every like Subaru company uh conference that comes through town and <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like a very specific story uh, <laughs> now you and i met i obviously like i've been a fan of of your work just being a, like a nerdy entertainer in portland like i've been a fan of your work pretty much uh since you went viral like it, well, like the minute i found out like what you were doing i was like that dude has it figured out and this is amazing um but then you and I met in 2018 at the Northwest Podcast Festival, which was at the Hawthorne Theater. Um, you had a podcast at the time. It was about uh, <laughs> movies, if I remember correctly. That is correct. Uh, are you are you still doing the podcast? What's going on with that? Yes. Um, so that we, that's right. Um, we were there um, doing a live taping of uh, the show that I do with uh, my two co-hosts, uh, Mark Middleton and Todd Workoven. And, uh, we do uh, Portland at the Movies, which is a podcast where every every month we watch a movie um, that was filmed in Portland and then talk about it. Nice. Um, and it has been just the most fascinating uh, journey and uh, look at this the Portland film scene, which, you know, most people would not uh, probably expect is as large as it is. Yeah. Um, I think we've got a list of movies that <clears throat> we're, we're working through when we first started doing it, you know, we, we didn't know how long it would go on because we didn't <laughs> think that there were that many movies filmed in Portland, but um, yeah. I think our list list of movies is over 300 uh, now. Holy um, cow. Yeah. And uh, you know, a lot of them are pretty obscure. There's a lot of, you know, kind of uh, in underground indie art house flicks, but um, I think my favorite subgenre of movies filmed in Portland uh, are are made for TV movies between 1979 and like 1996. Um, <laughs> they're Portland That's so somehow, specific. <laughs> yes, Portland somehow during that time frame became like the city to film uh, like made for TV crime drama based on a true story type films. Huh. Um, and it's just fascinating. Uh, the, some of the stars in them and and uh the stories that, the, that they tell and, and like there was even um i think uh a a uh shortly after 9 11 they made um some sort of no i take it back it was um it was after the the like what was it 93 world trade center bombing um mm. they made uh, a made for tv movie about that and portland was the stand-in for new york city <laughs> uh that's i love portland but that's a stretch. Yeah. <laughs> they, they can get really uh, creative. I've seen uh, the area around the um, Skidmore fountain, uh, like as a stand in for a European uh, for, for cities in Europe or something. And they'll put like little tables and then suddenly they're at a cafe terrace in Paris. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, um, when they shot leverage here, uh, and Portland was supposed to be a stand in for Chicago. Mm -hmm. I was like, or, or was it Boston? One of those. And I was like, uh, I mean, okay, maybe, maybe you look, you know, you, you don't look too close at some of the buildings. Maybe yeah. I could see it being one of those other like older cities, uh, across the country. Um, 
but then uh uh I knew I knew it had gone too far when they had a flyover shot of Portland as the stand in for Star City in uh <laughs> in the Flash. Uh <laughs> and they just flipped it backwards. So <laughs> so it's this beautiful flyover like helicopter shot of the Portland skyline but it's flipped like reverse That's so hilarious. that it doesn't quite look right and it's coming from the other direction uh but if you just flip it around no that's definitely portland mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> um so yeah no I, i've i've noticed that uh i've noticed that portland tends to attract a really uh a, let's go with creative type of filmmaker uh, somebody who really thinks outside of the box and isn't necessarily looking to shoot in the same old locations around LA or whatever. Um, and, and I appreciate that. I appreciate that. Like, you know, there are still, even now in 24, in 2024, there's pockets of places around Portland that still have that old world feel. And yeah, some of the cobblestone is sticking out of the concrete in some right. places, you know, like it, it can make for kind of a cool, a cool backdrop i think so yeah it's got that lived in feel yeah <laughs> i think lived in is a generous term um, <laughs> 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 um which like i can only imagine what that does for somebody on a unicycle having to having to navigate things like cobblestones and potholes and <laughs> um but uh okay so you guys are so you guys are a monthly podcast. Yes. Folks, I am thrilled to announce that this episode has once again been sponsored by Vault 31 Bar. Vault 31 is a state of the art shelter designed by the best minds in the business for absolutely anyone that's 21 plus and lives for all things video games and geek culture. If you need to quench your thirst after a long day in the wasteland, Vault 31 offers an incredible selection of beverages and signature cocktails to help you rehydrate. Or if you're hungry, they've got plenty of delicious options available from their kitchen, including their new Smirchbergs or my recently discovered favorite, the Batcave. Since they are a gaming bar, they have tons of PC and console games available to play. And whether you hail from the Brotherhood, the Institute, the Atom Cats, or the Minutemen, every nerd from New California to the Commonwealth is welcome here. Vault 31 is just off East Mill Plain in Vancouver, Washington, and only a short 10 to 12 minute trip across the river from the Portland International Airport. Be sure to visit them at vault31bar.com or at vault31bar on Facebook, Instagram, X, YouTube, and Twitch. Vault 31 is easily one of my favorite hangout spots in the greater Portland area, which is why I'm both flattered and excited to be partnering with them on bringing you future episodes of this podcast. Please be sure to check out their events calendar to find out what they'll be up to next. And when you do get a chance to stop by, please let them know I sent you. Maybe I'll even see you there. And with that, let's get back to the show. You mentioned that the Weird Portland United is still doing stuff. You mentioned that you're still doing like the beer stuff. Um, and you're still, I, I assume, raising money for things. Um, yeah. what, what kind of stuff is World, Weird Portland United raising money for? Like what, what are you, what are, are you focusing on these days? So, um, I, I'm very excited. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, so we mentioned that this was a thing that I started back in 2018 and I am so excited to where the organization is at right now because we just transitioned. Um, and I am no longer the president of Weird Portland United. Um, I have passed that torch off to um uh, a very wonderful woman named uh, christine lassiter and um she has she has so much more time to devote to it than i did trying to manage so many things at once yeah um and just to see her kind of take that and and run with it now is is been uh amazing because it, it my goal was always to kind of get the ball rolling for this thing and let the movement you know become bigger than me and you know i um, I get to still be involved as a, as a board member, but you know, this is something that is bigger than me now. So that's, that's what I wanted. Um, and so where, uh, what we're focusing on at the moment is, um, we are planning, uh, the very first, uh, weird Portland festival, um, really? this, this coming September. Yes. Um, and it's going to be, um, at Oaks park. Um, and we are expecting, you know, 
roughly 1500 people and we're going to have um weird uh musicians and uh um anybody who is affiliated with any organization that is like unique and and very niche in portland they're going to be represented there so you can come out and uh people who live here who who don't necessarily know everything that the city has to offer and and why it we love this weird culture. Um, you're going to be able to find out. Um, so yeah, that's very, very exciting. You know, we're just planning and looking, getting sponsors lined up and that sort of thing, uh, right now. Um, but, uh, it will definitely be the biggest thing that we have done as an organization yet. Uh, Interesting. Yeah. And hmm. on top of that, we're also working with the, uh, Portland street art Alliance. Um, okay. and, uh, we're doing uh we're planning to launch a series of murals around the city um to highlight and show off some of our awesome weird culture wow that sounds yeah. really cool do you have like specific locations in mind that you're willing to share with me maybe for the first time on this show <laughs> um we're we're in that process right now because uh the street art alliance um is such a cool organization and they facilitate um, a lot of the murals that you see around town. And they work with the business owners and the city um, to kind of uh, curate a list of walls available for murals. Uh, and then they work with the people who are, you know, an artist that want to get those murals installed and find the best location. Um, and, you know, not only do you have to come up with the money to pay the artist to to uh paint the mural but then you also have to come up with a plan for maintaining the mural um and find ways to uh pre prevent um defacement and graffiti and, and that stuff so it's a really involved process um and it takes a, a lot of money both up front and for the um main long-term maintenance of, of the murals too so we don't have a particular wall picked out but we've got like a, a book that we're looking through of possibilities um, and then, you know, we're also looking at artists and it's kind of pairing the three things up together to, to turn something into uh, real, real life art. That's really cool. Um, do you know roughly when we can expect to start seeing some of these murals pop up? Um, it, it kind of depends on the, the funding process. Um, mm. so the, uh, the street art Alliance has their finger on the pulse of like, um, uh, grant money that's available for projects like this oh wow um, yeah so uh we are going to be sourcing you know some of the money is going to come from from us from the organization um but you know we, we also need some additional money um and so we'll find um a grant um and, and they have like uh there's all these different grants that are uh kind of on a rolling cycle uh and so we'll put together a proposal and uh cross our fingers and hope we get some some money raised Wow. That as soon as we get the money, they, they, we're ready to roll. We just got to basically get the money together. Gotcha. Gotcha. I mean, yeah. that's, that sounds really cool. Um, and depending on the, you know, the size of the mural, these things cost anywhere from like uh, 20,000 all the way up to like 70 grand um, for, for a mural. Now you mentioned one thing about weird Portland United. Uh, obviously they're the, under new uh, president, uh, and you mentioned that uh, the president is, is a, a member of a board of people. So there, as obviously it's not just you in right. Weird Portland United. There's, there's several folks involved. Um, can you give me an idea of like how many people are involved either with the board or just with the organization in general? Do you have an idea of membership? Yeah, so um, the it, it, it's a, a nonprofit run by a managing board of, I think right now, about six individuals. Um, but we also have a very large network of, uh, volunteers, uh, and, and people that we work closely with, um, for, for instance, um, uh, we are, I can't say who it is yet, but we're partnering with a, a Portland institution, um, that they're going to be doing a fundraiser and give some money to the organization. Um, and, uh, they're hosting, uh, an anniversary event to celebrate the 30th anniversary of their organization. And the theme is going to be uh, Weird Portland. So um, we're going to uh, show up and, and have some of, uh, you know, the more well-known known, uh, costumed characters um, be at this event, like the Unipiper uh, and the, the Portland Slee Stack and um, the uh, Silver Statue Man and, and, and things like that. So, yeah. you know, 
we've got all these um, interesting people in Portland. And um, my thought was like, uh, what, what can we do if we get them all together and, you know, um, push in the same direction? So that's, that's kind of what the thought was behind that. Hmm. I did a I did a quick uh, Google search just because I was curious about something. Um, and my guess for who this organization is was very wrong. So uh, <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking I was thinking Portland Art Museum. No, they were founded in 1892. Uh, and then I was thinking maybe maybe OMSI. Are you partnering with OMSI? No, they were founded in 1944. So <laughs> I'll, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you after we stop recording. Oh, really? Okay. All right. All right. All right. So I guess folks have to just stay tuned um, and uh, uh, wait to hear the announcement. So once that's right, because there will be an opportunity um, for anyone who wants to experience this uh, for themselves to to get a ticket. Nice. Okay. Okay. Uh, And uh, where where will people be able to find you if they want to keep up on what's going on? Should they just follow Weird Portland United on social or what's the best way to do that? Um, yes, uh, follow, they can follow both myself and Weird Portland United on all the socials, uh, at the Unipiper and Weird Portland United. Nice. Okay. Um, so what, what does the Unipiper have planned? I know uh, Weird Portland United is such a cool organization and they're doing some really cool things. Um, but as the Unipiper, do you have anything, uh, excuse the phrase coming down the pipe? <laughs> <clears throat> uh at all like later this year any any big plans for the unipiper going into the rest of 2024 um most of my big plans are uh tied with uh weird portland united at the moment um but other than that i'm still doing most of the standard unipiper things that you've come to expect uh, from me and that you know includes everything uh up to and including just randomly riding through the city creating general uh merriment and confusion um (laughs) and uh i I, i've got some other exciting things coming up um in addition to the retro gaming expo this year i'll be at the um uh salem comic-con uh i think it's the uh, mid valley comic art expo Mm -hmm. Um, yeah and that that is in uh mid-april um oh and uh on april 13th i will be playing the national anthem at the timbers game very cool uh my team, the Ghostbusters, the Portland Ghostbusters, um, they, I believe, are planning to go to the Mid Valley Comic Con as well. Oh, excellent! Um, yeah, I don't know if I'll be able to make that, um, but uh, but if the Portland Ghostbusters are are around, anybody listening to this, if you're at an event and you see the Portland Ghostbusters, like tell them Switch said hey, because um, <laughs> I lo- I love being a part of that team. Unfortunately, I don't always get to like be a part of like the things that they do just because i also you know as you know like i'm also an entertainer and i also do things as dj switch not as a ghostbuster right um but uh uh yeah that's that's i mean so yeah it's 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 fascinating how much we really like cross paths a lot uh and yet like we're just finally getting a chance to sit down and talk man this has been seriously fantastic i'm so glad we did this it it has been yeah <laughs> long overdue um well listen uh thank you so much for taking the time to like hang out today and uh for taking the time to tell us a little bit about your background in gaming and and what you've got going on of course of course yeah we'll have to get up sometime and uh continue this conversation oh i'm sure that we will <laughs> That's going to do it for my interview with the Unipiper today, folks. A short but very, very, very high-quality interview. I'm so excited that I got to talk to him, and I got to find out more about what he's got going on, and, of course, to discover more about his relationship with video games and how it informs the kind of nerd that he is today. Um, In fact, it was wild to me how much he and I had in common uh, in terms of the gaming that we did growing up. He had a Commodore. I had an Amiga. And then we both ended up on the Genesis uh, and then the N64 and then on from there. So uh, he and I have surprisingly similar backgrounds in gaming, and it was really fun to connect with him on that. Of course, a massive thank you to the Unipiper for taking the time to hang out. If you want more, there is more available on the Patreon, patreon.com slash DJ Switch PDX. And last but not least, and I know I'm really bad about asking for this, but 
If you enjoyed this interview, please consider subscribing to my YouTube channel. I need to get my YouTube numbers up uh, to continue to counteract all of my old YouTube subscribers that have been falling off uh, because they're they're not interested in this kind of content. I used to make different kind of content, and um, and so I'm I'm losing numbers about as fast as I'm gaining them, and I'm hoping to kind of shift the ratio in my favor again. Uh, and so, uh, subscribing would honestly, it would mean a lot to me. It would mean a lot to, uh, the folks that are helping me make this thing happen. The retro game expo, the, you know, the folks at vault 31 bar, like, uh, subscribing is huge right now. And it, it genuinely doesn't cost you anything. Uh, uh, so please consider subscribing if, if you're enjoying this show and you'd like to see a lot more. Uh, I have more. In fact, next week's episode has already been recorded and it's a very special one as well. So, I'm looking forward to sharing that with you. But in the meantime, I want to thank you all for taking the time to listen today, and I will see you on the next one.